cabinets are going to be <laughs> and how it's broken down. Okay, Janet. Thank you, James. It's always good to be back here in Reading. It's a beautiful uh, spring day. Um, we are going to look at here and there this evening rather than there and here. We're going to start in Reading um, with Wallace Stevens' home. It's his birthplace. He uh, went to NYU to law school and he went to Harvard University. Um, but he was born and lived here in Reading and went to high school here. And so he's we both spent went, most of his life here. Yes, and we both uh, went and found his house, and we're going to share it with our viewers and hope that they'll uh, visit it as well, and someday we might see it turned into a museum, which would be really wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read uh, a, a poem which every American listening um, should probably have heard at some point. Um, then we're going on uh, to listen to uh, an interview with Charles Bernstein, who is a poet and a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and his wife, uh, who is an artist and illustrator, and they live in New York City. Um, and by way of introduction, we're going to see a little bit of the gates, which were in Central Park. Um, this winter, which many of our viewers may have seen and certainly brightened uh, the gray winter days for us who uh, remained here and weren't off to the tropics. Um, following that, we are going um, to end with a homage to Mother's Day um, and a uh, homage to uh, the first American president ever visiting Georgia, about which our viewers have heard two, three times uh, from me in our discussions on this program, and I want to remind them that that was the place that they heard about and that uh, it is being visited by the first American president ever uh, today, and it actually, um, given the time difference, at about 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, and so it brought back some memories, and we're going to return to Georgia, but we're going to honor Georgia uh, not with politics, but with um, child protection, high-risk child protection, which is a project that I worked with there, and, uh, and dedicate it to our Mother's Day here in America. <clears throat> the Middle Heart, and she's just been on tour with it uh, in America. And the back side shows a portrait of her. And it is a, a, a biography of three uh, Chinese who are from all different strata in the Chinese um, society. And their pledge, if you will, in American terms, like blood brothers, uh, the white and the Native American Indian used to cut blood and, and become brother and brother or brother and sister. And these three make that pledge that no matter what happens to them historically, um, they will remain together. I am about halfway through it, and it's a beautiful book. Um, her first book was Spring Moon. And this is the story of a, a Chinese woman um, who lived in China until she was about age 10 and came here, grew up in California, um, was educated here and in Hawaii um, at Tufts and at <coughs> the University of Hawaii, met her husband Winston Lord, who whisked her back to the Orient, um, where he had a career as a diplomat. And her reception in China was difficult for her because she was speaking about a Chinese life when she had not lived in China. And I think we might bear that in mind when we speak about Pearl Buck tonight, where we're speaking about an American who did not grow up in America, but came back to tell Americans about what it was like to be Chinese. We also have with us, and, and I guess credentials, <laughs> it almost seems beside the point with Peter at this point, but I guess Yale, PhD Yale? Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Which is not beside the point, <laughs> really, is it? <laughs> and undergraduate? Uh, landscape. Um, with the plains in Kosovo covered by blackbirds, which I'm looking forward to seeing. But what was the site of an extraordinary massacre uh, in the 14th century by the Turks, and which gave justification, um, as Kudara points out in this elegy, uh, for Milosevic to conduct another massacre. Uh, by what rationale? Um, I'm sure we do not know, and I'm not here to discuss. Um, but it's fascinating to know that concurrent with the Song of Roland in England and France uh, at that time period that uh, in Kosovo, a much less known part of the world to us uh, in the Baltic states, um, there was a great poem written which honors King Michael uh, in the plains of, uh, of Kosovo and the blackbirds. 
about which I had known nothing um, and about which I am learning something. And I'm looking forward to, um, as I have in the other countries, learning about the cultural heritage of these people. So I would like to remind our listeners of the 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, um, which if they didn't read this in high school, they certainly missed an experience and was one of my most memorable poems uh, there and in college. 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. One, among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. Two, I was of three minds like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. Three, the blackbird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. Four, a man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. Five, I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. Six, icicles filled the long window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. Seven, O oh, thin men of Hadam, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women around you? Eight, I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms, but I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. Nine, when the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. 10, at the sight of blackbirds flying in green light, even the bods of euphony would cry out sharply. 11, he rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. 12, the river is moving, the blackbird must be flying. 13, it was evening all afternoon. It was snowing and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. I actually read that earlier this evening. Yes. And well, it's meant to be read on the page. Wallace Stevens um, meant it to be read on the page as it is a poem, but to be performed as well. So that, by way of introduction, links those unknown mysterious blackbirds on this unknown mysterious plain in Kosovo in the 14th century uh, to Wallace Stevens and the um, blackbirds on a page in his collection of poems. So why don't we go to the tape and uh, see uh, his house here. Okay. Uh, do you want to lead into the tape? Well, that's the lead right there. Okay. Let's go into the tape. Should take a couple of seconds. I did several books on my own. But then we decided to try to set one of Charles's poems with the photos, the altered photos which I was doing. So this was 1981. And it's called The Occurrence of Tune. And it's one long poem. All right, let's take a look at the book and, itself. And uh, the book has um, altered photographs. And they're facing pages, but not each page. And some of it's just text. And the idea was, is in all of the books, they're not literal illustrations, but they're actually, since the poem is fairly abstract, they're actually fairly abstract in response to the poem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we didn't want it really to be a one-on-one -on -one illustration of the poem, but rather um, more of a poetic response to the poem. 
And that's sort of been the way I've been working on my collaborations since approach to the poem. Okay. So um, in the nude formalism, I made little settings, frames actually, for each poem, and then each poem is set in a different typeface. So this one's more about diversity rather than unity. Uh, uh, the poems are, you know, change depending on how they look. Quite apart from what you might think of as the pictorial dimension of the poem, the uh, way in which the lettering is done, the font, right. uh, the way it is on the page, the size of the page, also affects the meaning and the reading experience. Uh, we were trying in this book to go uh, as radically against the concept that type shouldn't uh, be self-conscious, that the type should disappear. And by having each poem done in a different typeface uh, and having almost a kind of neo-Victorian decorative quality in some cases and a kind of quasi-futurist style in the first one and having these conflicting styles, uh, it creates a you know a dimension of what the poetic experience is, uh, and then as well as the pictures. So uh, yeah, in the end, this this seems to me is what what the poem is, are. They have to do with the visual design in the book. Headed us both to Tucson, Arizona, when Emma was what a couple of years old. When our daughter was like three years old, um, and, and we did and this. And to spend a week there to work on the book. So he had in mind that the, the three of us could go and do oh, the book. fabulous. And he would talk to us about what was possible with the printing uh, and so on, like could we do gold and so on, which I guess you must have asked him. Uh, well, because the name of the book suggested. was Fool's Gold, so we decided to do it in black and gold. Now so this it was printed in two colors. This poem did not exist as an independent entity. Did not? No. no this, he wrote this it. is different. Um, I actually... Did you write it on site when you were no, there? No, uh, it's composed of a number of different elements. and. Um, Fragments, actually. Some of them are actually poems that are, that, that are, are t you know, discreet, that could be pulled out, like Trill, which is probably published in uh, one of the, you know, it, it is, is published in one of my other books. Trill might be the only thing. Um, then there are some individual lines, some things are lines taken from things. So there's a number of different elements called from different places, and some were probably composed specifically for the format and place that was created. Uh, here. So it, this was not a discrete text. It doesn't exist apart from the book, although elements of this could appear in other things, although by and large they don't. What came first then? Did, did but he had Susan a little notebook, uh, you had little notebook entries. I had a whole lot of, I had called a lot of individual sections, you might say. So you selected either, them. Either aphoristic comments or, right. or, or short uh, pieces. And they had many of those things, and then uh, fitted them to the space. Well, Susan probably picked, you know, which one. I she think wanted, we picked I'm them sure. together, or I picked, you know, like this says, "You took the mouth right out of my words." There were these little phrases, and it was setting the little phrases. And then what's nice about it is that the type goes in all different directions. Like so, it says, now did you choose the text before you did the? Illustration, um, Susan? I think sort of at the same time. You just because I was actually yes, working like on that. this book there in situ. So I had I had the format. Once Did you say, time. Charles? I need a text now. Right. <laughs> and he would cut out. He had little phrases that. Because I these this, this wasn't sketched out. out. In other words, I think it was sketched out and then it was set by the printer. Most of the phrases in this only exist in this book. They're not. They're not Let go of your lot. tongue. Yeah. But, well, by and large, all, all the visual decisions are, are made by by Susan. She might have said, "What could go here? Could you give me something?" that might go here below this Actually, image. Charles and chose to put a little that. crossword puzzle in because we were reading the paper and he thought it would be nice to have a little crossword puzzle. So that got sent into here. And then it has a poem underneath it. So that uh, was where, a nice you know, this is a long time ago, so I can't <laughs> <laughs> Charles doesn't remember that. But I wouldn't have put the crossword puzzle in. He added the crossword puzzle. But I put the drawings in around Previous it. puzzle solved. That's what I like. I, I like this one because there's a, this one is more like a painting. It's more like my paintings in that there's a lot of space. I like the space. It's very spaced out for a poetry book, you know, like, and also the type doesn't all go in one direction. It goes in different directions, so it gives more of a sense of being like a page that is more like a drawing. Well, and also the, the element, as Charles is making the point about the words actually becoming um, design yeah, elements. Yeah, part of the design elements. Whether I we know their, their content in terms of their I'd signification. In this case, because we did it that way, 
I um, you might have actually added these words like yeah I think I probably drawing. wrote the words in there I probably wrote some of this you stuff did some in Tucson so you improvised um, yeah. some of it while we were working on it and said why don't you use this for that, that that's probably what happened yeah. and did you sign uh, all of them yeah. or I don't know that they're signed actually but they're, um, they're numbered they're each one is each it is numbered yeah uh, you know a book like this really you can't circulate very much so it's uh, Right. It's, it's the nature of this, unlike a poem. It's more like a painting in that way, right. or like a, 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 a lithograph or something like that. Those are more like paintings. I mean, in other words, the paintings are one of a kind, and the art books that are limited edition are also, you know, more about A, they're more valuable, <laughs> right. and they're also really sort of like paintings. I mean, this one, the first one I did art. that was hand painted actually. Oh. This is a hand-painted book. Oh, beautiful. Um, but this is not a collaboration. This is actually the first one I did for Granary Books, which became my publisher after these other books were done. Mm -hmm. um, he actually asked me to do a book of my own, which was interesting, because I had done some books of my own, but um, not this elaborate. And so this one actually doesn't involve a poet, photo books. So altogether, I've done 11 books, but five with Charles, and then I've collaborated with other people. So um, it's, I just feel like I don't want to be limited. So I've also done books on my own, and I've done books with Susan Howe, jo Johanna Drucker, and now I'm doing one with Jerry Rothenberg. So, um, you know, the collab I feel like it's good for me to collaborate, not just with him. Like uh, with a composer where I've written librettos, the, one typically thinks of the, of the opera that results as the work of the composer, although the librettos is an important to contributor to it, uh, but in that auteur sense. And I think the, the artist books, especially uh, Little Orphan and Little Orphan and Graham Tailspin, and they, these are really, from my point of view, Susan's paintings that incorporate my work, so I'm delighted by that. But in a lot of ways, in, in respect to uh, the nature of the connection between the panel, because a book, of course, is a particular kind of binding and so on, and you move one one through the next, right. but the ability to have this larger spatial dimension of multiple elements that exist simultaneously is a kind of impossible to achieve, but implicit idea of what a book could be. That was um, Susan B. and um, Charles uh, Bernstein. Right. And um, that was segment was about nine minutes long that we saw. And uh, she is being a designer, an illustrator, and uh, he being a poet. Yes. Known he, for his poetry. Yes, he's a language poet, and he's at the University of Pennsylvania. And okay, a wonderful would you professor. define that language poet? Well, he defined it to a certain extent um, in, that, in that first segment um, in which he was speaking about the visual uh, poetry, concrete poetry, uh, and about his concept of uh, collage and fragments and where he painted, looked to her painting and he said, um, isn't that interesting that she can take the different drawings that she has here, put it up on a canvas, and then it's a painting and yet there's segments like the pages of a book. Uh, couldn't we do that with a book? Couldn't we dismantle it and mount it on a canvas? And what is the difference? And the play is the difference between what reading a painting is and reading a book is, and what a poem is and what a painting is. And this is a query which um, many painters uh, and more poets have pursued. William Carlos Williams wanted to be a painter. And so he said, in that he felt he could not be a painter, uh, his primary profession being a physician, uh, he would paint with words. And therefore, he concentrated on the only reality in things and images. And Charles Bernstein is a part of a language that has gone beyond that, a sort of deconstructed and allowed language, a kind of fluidity. Um, and in our everyday lives, most people's language have more fluidity than syntax uh, and context. Um, so we're not hearing a lot from him in this about uh, his poetry. 
what we're concentrating on in this interview is their collaboration. It was very curious and interesting, which gave rise to the inspiration to do this program, though there's been quite a bit of attention um, in the last few years to this subject. Uh, Bob Perlman, who's also a language poet, a um, very fine one from San Francisco, um, the language poets are actually concentrated here in Philadelphia now because Rachel Duplessis is over at Temple University, and those are three very fine representatives, Susan Howe being another one um, out in San Francisco. Anyway, Bob came here, and I actually worked with him the first year that he came here. I was a reader for his course at University of Pennsylvania. And he and his wife, his wife retired from teaching at Quaker School and has gone back to her own work, and she's a visual artist. And so they did a little book. Um, where she did some drawings there of kind of amorphous, kind of monster-like creatures. Um, no real relation to the poetry. Just the poetry and the, the creatures are together. So it was a different sort of collaboration. Um, but as you heard from Charles, there is a real collaboration and cooperation between the two. And you see this in their intimacy in discussing the subject. And this is what I wanted to explore, where there's boundaries, whether um, it's husband and wife, or whether it's colleague collegial, mm -hmm. such as Philip Glass, who's a, a regular in the National Arts Program for you, um, has just done a musical piece on Chuck Close, and reciprocating uh, Chuck Close having done a number of paintings of him. And so he has taken a portrait in music, and of course it has a very different kind of imagery in music. Um, and there, this crossing of boundaries is happening uh, oftentimes. Another wonderful one is that a number of wives, like Susan B. Of, of painters and of poets who are more famous than we know, are often featured in the exhibitions after their death and after their husband's death. An example is Milton Avery and his wife, Sally Mitchell, uh, or Michael. Uh, and there was a beautiful exhibit of her work in 2003 at the Nodler. And here it shows them in partnership working. Um, perhaps the camera can pick that up. Um, and I was very affected by this, um, that they had had a living partnership in um, visual art, uh, kind of cooperative and collaborative process. But you don't uh, hear much about that. No, you? and her, her art tended to be more portraits, a lot of portraits of her husband and of uh, people that they knew. And they're of great charm. There was another exhibit at the Cooper Hewitt uh, this year of Joseph and Annie Elbers. Again, Joseph Elbers is far more famous in our minds than Annie. Um, but this particular show focused on their cooperation, collaboration, intersection, joint projects, and as Susan showed us, you know, projects were well, not Anna done Elbers together. Anna Elbers always, even when she was in school at the Bauhaus, was always with textiles. Right. Weaving. Right. Whereas Albert, Joseph, the actually furniture. was stained glass. Right. He worked and It was with later it. that he became involved with the trans to the transition of painting. That's a very fine distinction to make because they're working in different materials. Well, words and paint are different materials too with Charles and Susan. Charles is working exclusively with words. He he um, But it's even qualifies, further. It's even further. He qualifies his work by saying that he can't do visually what Susan does. So that's why he's so amazed that she can, you know, think up things to draw and to paint. Because yeah, but he can thinks she in do language. What he does? No. See, so mm, and that's, that's, that's where the collaboration comes in. Right, and that's the question that I wanted to raise of where these boundaries shift and where there's mutual respect and cooperation, and then where, there's, where the partners, whether spouses or whether professional partners, Philip Guston and Clark Coolidge is another example. Uh, brilliant for example. Quite a while. Right. Brilliant example of an extraordinary influence in our, in our time period. Um, and Gustin has a whole series of works with Clark's poems involved, and uh, um, Clark is actually working on his, his memoirs now. So this is, this is an extraordinarily rich professional, like not the same as Close and Glass, but there we have some reciprocity going on. Another example, which surprised me, was Elise Asher. Do you know her work? She is the... Um, wife, both of them deceased, of, of Stanley Kunitz, who's much more no, well known to us, the poet. And she's represented by the June Kelly Gallery, and in September and October of 2004, she writes poems and she paints. Perhaps the camera can pick up her works as well. Uh, 
there was a celebration of her work by the gallery. But again, post-mortem. Um, <laughs> and we didn't hear much about her in her lifetime, but we heard a great deal from her husband. I think this is fascinating because Charles very generously brought out how appreciative he is of his wife's work, how there is a kind of, um, oh, re not reciprocal.